for it TV. The world is thinking. The day of this speech comes, and I'm up on this dais with a dozen other women, and I was the last speaker, and they're all getting up and giving these, you know, very polite speeches. Uh, you know, I want to thank my mother for all the sacrifices she made to help me win this award. And I look down at my speech, and I start reading it again, and I go, ooh, this, this, is, this is not right. Um, the tone of this is really wrong, but it was kind of late to write another speech, so I, I didn't have much to do except get up and give this speech. So I get up, and um, the speech begins... I've been thinking about my mother and all the ways she made me into the person that I am. She didn't do it in any of the ordinary ways. She wasn't a great writer or a great businesswoman or even, if truth be told, a particularly good mother. I think she tried to be a good wife, but she wasn't much at keeping house, and I don't think I've ever met anyone who was a worse cook. But my mother was a great example of everything I didn't want to be. And to this day, I wake up every morning grateful that I'm not her. And I'm at the Waldorf Astoria. There are 1,500 people out there. And there is this audible. <gasps> and my best friend who was in the audience said, boy, I didn't know where you were going with this one, but it didn't sound good to me. But then I went on to say, uh, grateful, in fact, not to be any of the women of her generation who were unlucky enough to have been born at what seems to me to have been the worst possible time to have been a middle-class American woman. When my mother was five, she answered the telephone by saying this, how often are the pains coming? Little wonder then that she wanted to go to medical school and become a doctor like her father. But when she announced this to her parents, they looked her up and down and said, you're no beauty and it's too bad you're such an intellectual, but if you become a doctor, no man will ever marry you. So mom got a PhD in musicology, thinking that she would become an impresario like her, mo her mother. My grandmother was, by everybody's estimation, a formidable businesswoman. She brought great musicians to Cleveland, she started a lecture series, and mom said she could look at any theater and count the house in a second. But when the depression ended, my grandmother folded her business. As she later explained to my mother, her work was just a stopgap measure, her way of helping out during hard times. Good women didn't work if they didn't have to. It would only humiliate their husbands and make the world think their men couldn't support them. So mom took her degree and opened a bookstore. It was a ladylike profession, but it was also something that made her very happy. She corresponded with authors all over the world, asking Bertrand Russell to explain his views on atheism and Max Eastman to tell her about his politics. Sometimes, when I was small, I'd find her sitting in the living room, crying as she reread their letters. She did marry, but not until she was almost 30, late enough that everybody was whispering spinster behind her back. And sure enough, after the wedding, everyone expected her to settle down, leave her bookstore behind, and have her babies. There were a few problems with this plan. In the first place, mom wasn't exactly maternal. Babies bored her to tears. Happily, in her time, there were nursemaids to care for the kids. I'll bet my mother never changed a diaper. And that's precisely the problem. She didn't do much else, either. In earlier times, keeping house had been a full-time job, even for those with servants. But by the time mom married, so many labor-saving devices had been introduced that cooking and cleaning just didn't take that long. My mother and most of her friends literally had nothing to do. I have never known so many unhappy people. They were smart, they were educated, and they were bored. Some of them did charitable work, but it wasn't fulfilling. Their misery was an ugly thing, and it was hard on their families. It was a terrible waste of talent and energy, and watching them, I knew that I was never going to be like them. Every night when my father came in from work, he'd set his briefcase down in the hall, and I saw the little transformation that occurred. I realized that he had a secret life, one that he had when he was away from us, and that it nurtured him and fed his soul. 
I watched him leaving in the morning, jealous that he had an escape hatch, wishing that my mother could go to work too. I thought if she had her own secret life, she would be a happier person. And I determined when I was very small that no matter what, nobody was ever going to keep me from having a work life. And so today, when people ask me, why do you work so hard? I say, because I can. So there was this kind of stunned silence when I finished and this little smattering of applause, but then I went and sat down. And Christiane Amanpour was on one side of me and she turned to me and there were tears streaming down her face and she said, that's my mother's life you just talked about. And Diane von Furstenberg was on the other side and she was crying too. And then uh, as I was leaving, I went into the ladies' room and there were 10 women in there sobbing. Um, <laughs> And over the next few weeks, I got letters and emails from people all over the country saying that they had been thinking about this speech and how much it had meant to them, that it had really made them think about their mothers. 